Boroff here at Harkins Hall. When Providence College first opened its doors in 1919, Harkins was our first and only building on campus. It contained classrooms, a library, a church, as well as common areas for students. Notice the slight curvature on the front face of the building, which is meant to symbolize the open arms of Providence College. That message of welcoming others with open arms is something that Providence has stayed true to even today. It is impressive to reflect on our school and how much it has grown and developed into today. Before Providence first opened its doors in 1919, it had faced obstacles provided by World War I that delayed its opening of the school. Additionally, conflicts like World War I and the Great Depression saw enrollment plummet, causing another obstacle for the school to go to get over. Still, through the guidance and leadership from our early presidents of Providence College, such as President Casey, President Noon, President Dillon, and President Slavin, Providence uh, was not only able to stay open, but able to expand. Remember we talked about welcoming. Well, the early presidents at Providence worked hard to ensure that everyone here felt welcome. In 1922, Providence, President Noon and Providence College welcomed their first full-time Jewish student here at Providence College. Not long after, Providence welcomed its first female student to its summer school program in 1950 under President Slavin. It is because of the leadership and the problem solving of our presidents that we were able to grow our college from 18 to 45 acres, from one building to seven, and to produce over 2,500 alumni by 1947. President Dillon once said, when, the, when in future days the historians record the growth and development of Providence College, the alumni and extension school will appear as uh, important factors. What I'd wanna leave you with today is that Dillon, President Dillon didn't give himself enough credit as the growth and expansion of Providence College was also, uh, was also helped by the early presidents here. The Phillips Memorial Library has been a place entrusted with providing resources and a study space for all Providence College students. The library has allowed students a place to grow in their education and academic success individually and with one another in the community. This focus on personal growth and achieving goals through academic success is a trait the first women's class had when they first attended this campus in 1971. The first group of co-ed students look to make their place on campus present through their pursuit of education. Many people doubted their place on campus with statements such as, what do they know? They're only women. But this only proved to motivate them further. Their academic success and goals pushed them to grow as independent women and to find their footing on campus through leadership roles in student government and clubs. The first women's class made their future opportunities for education possible for all women through their enrollment in honors programs, making the dean's list, and ranking higher than fellow male students academically come graduation. Overall, they laid the foundation for all future women on this campus through their struggles and academic success. When the first female class arrived on campus on September 7, 1971, the women moved into Aquinas Hall. At the time, it was the only female dorm on campus. In the fall of 1918, the Sisters of the Orders of St. Dominic and Mercy attended some of the first courses ever offered at Providence College, but they were not enrolled in the school. Maureen Whelan was the first female admitted to PC and served as the poster co-ed for the first female class. She studied humanities while at Providence and even went abroad to Switzerland during her junior year. Dr. Elaine Chaika was the first woman to receive a full-time teaching position as a professor of linguistics in 1980. Dr. Chaika attended Rhode Island College and received her PhD from Brown University. Dr. Chaika did lots of research during her time at PC. She mainly did research on schizophrenic speech as well as different American accents, including the Rhode Island accent. Since women being admitted to Providence, there have been lots of firsts, such as Coach Aaron Bath becoming the first African-American coach in the program's history. Aquinas Hall still houses female students to this day, and half the building now houses male freshmen. Without the first women's class or even the first female faculty member, 
females on ca- on campus would not be where they are today or have the opportunities that they do today. All right, so here we have St. Dominic Chapel, one of the many reminders on campus of the friars of old who really um, influenced the Dominican tradition and kind of made it what it is today and how much it influences our school. There's also Aquinas Hall and various statues of friars around campus. And while it's obviously important to respect the past of the school and the history that made it what it is, I also think we should focus on the friars of today who have not only kept these ideas alive, but have also done so on this very campus. Just a few examples are Father Thomas Ertel, who was a student here and then graduated and got became a priest and spent his time here being a member of the community, actually speaking about the creation of this chapel just so long he was here, and also during finals week would carry on a hot dog cart to talk to students and make sure they were well fed for the times to come. There's also Father Quigley, a fellow um, alumni of Providence. He spent his decades here writing not only about what it means to be a priest in this modern time, but also things about, you know, loneliness, hope, and marriage, letters to students to kind of help them understand the world that they're in and the world that'll come once they graduate. And finally, another example we have is Father Thomas McGlynn, who, not an alumni of Providence, did create a lot of the art you see around campus, a statue of Martin de Porres um, over by the Koi Pond, and his legacy is here in his art and his impact in the art department. And these three are just examples of the many people on, the many friars on campus who have kept the tradition of what it means to be a Dominican friar alive. So again, as I said, it's incredibly important to remember the old friars who made us who we are, but I also think we should look to today and the friars around us who remind us again and again what it means to be a Dominican. Hi, I'm Logan Kroboth, and uh, my part of the tour is on uh, the purchase of Lower Campus, what used to be before it became the iconic PC Lower Campus. Uh, before it was, uh, before it became incorporated into the college, it was the Providence City Hospital, later renamed to the Chapin 5 Hospital. Uh, it uh, treated primarily infectious diseases and things like that up until the year of 1965, when the coinciding of uh, more mo- modern medical technologies uh, led to the uh, disuse of the hospital and uh, a commission was called by Governor Charles Chafee, um, sorry, John E. Chafee, uh, about whether or not uh, the, the, uh, the, the hospital could be closed. And that 11-person commission found that between the years of 1955 and 1964, use of the hospital's pediatric and communicable diseases departments had decreased significantly, as did its psychiatric care. And so... Uh, the city realistically moved to, to decommission the hospital. It was around this time, uh, when, in 1968, that the school began to formally lease some of the buildings for uh, dormitories. And by May of 1971, the school ended, ended the lease and then sought to formally purchase the property. And it would do so on December 6th of 1974 at the cost of $780,000. Um, nowadays, Lower Campus plays host to uh, an incredible amount of student activity. It's where the music center is, the business center, and so much more. It's also where the school is doing a lot of its renovations, and it's going to become even better than uh, and, and an even more integral part of students' life in at BC, while still uh, maintaining a lot of those original 1910 buildings, such as Fennel, Koffler, uh, Sullivan, and um, uh, uh, all the rest. I'm going to be talking about the Smith Center, you can see right behind there, and uh, the home of the PC Band, which was built in the early 2000s. Uh, but the PC Band itself was founded only five years after the school was founded, and the school was founded in 1917, and the PC Band was founded in 1921 under the direction of Reverend Vincent Donovan and Arthur A. Odeo, a student here on campus. Originally, there were 20 players in the band, they wore black crew neck sweaters and bow ties at all performances. And by World War II, there were 40 players when the school uh, hit pause on the band uh, because of uh, the conflict. Uh, at the time, they would play at football games, basketball games, and hockey games. And after World War II, because the band became uh, connected with the ROTC, uh, it also played at ROTC ceremonies throughout the campus. Uh, at, the, at its height, it was performing over 30 times a year. Uh, it was popular in the 1950s to see the band in the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York City. 
And by the 1970s, after the upheaval in the 1960s, uh, you have a, a series of changes in the band. Uh, the first women in the band appeared in 1971, the same year that women were admitted into the college. The ROTC disbanded its relationship with the band in 1973, and it became uh, less connected to the military. And the first time that you see the Cowell use the term pep band is in 1975. They released a band album uh, along with the Glee Club in 1962, which we have here. And I tried to transcribe, uh, or what do you call it, uh, play, a, play a, a, a clip of it, uh, but the, the, video, the, the audio file didn't turn out really well. But I, as a former uh, marching bandsman myself in college, I was like, we could do better than that. I brought an instrument. <laughs> <laughs> As we look out over Eaton Street, where Providence College seniors experience a great amount of freedom, uh, we have to look back and see how that was not always the case. There were many cases where students' freedom was limited, and they had to take matters into their own hands to get what they felt was fair treatment. Um, bubbling over from the spring semester of 1969, um, PC students were upset by poor communication between the faculty and student leaders, which led to a walkout from the convocation ceremony on September 27, 1969, in which 25 students walked out mid-ceremony. Um, but that ended up being only the peak of the iceberg for student-led protests in the year 1969, as a few weeks later, on October 15, 1969, Providence College students and faculty took place in the nationwide moratorium day in protest of the Vietnam War. The um, campus activities were canceled, and students and staff alike went out to spread the word about ending the war. But of course, the war did not end in October, and in May 1970, with a new wave of soldiers being sent to Cambodia to continue the war, and after the shooting of four Kent University students by National Guardsmen, PC students were part of a nationwide student strike, which in this case received quite a bit of support from the faculty as the school was effectively shut down for that month of May 1970. From that turbulent year, the passion that they showed for fighting for a better future continues today for all future Friars. Here at Siena Hall, where we were supposed to be, but we're not, um, is where the proposed monument for interfaith relationship would stand. As a school known for its Catholic roots, it is lesser known for its long-term relationship with the neighboring Jewish community of Providence's North End. Fortunately, with the research of Dr. Arthur Urbano and Dr. Jennifer Luzzi, more of this historic relationship has been brought to light. In 1922, PC accepted its first Jewish student from Western Rhode Island, which is actually my hometown, fun fact, one of many who would join the institution as a counter to the quota system put in place by other schools. Jewish students thrived at PC as people. In comparison to schools like the Ivy Leagues, where Jewish students were reported to be limited in their extracurricular and athletic involvement, PC opened multitudes of opportunities. Jewish students played sports, joined Friars Club, joined AST, which is Army Specialized Training, to name a few activities. In a wider context, rhetoric from a Catholic viewpoint on Judaism has been overwhelmingly negative. Stories often paint Jews as the cause of Jesus' death, an idea which inspires anti-Semitic theology. Fortunately, 20th century Catholics in Providence work to dismantle past tensions. At one PC interreligious conference, Rabbi Isaac encouraged different religions to dissolve prejudice and create bridges of mutuality. After 1965, Jewish students and staff actually reported alienation on campus for their religious beliefs. Although there is no succinct data as to the reason for this alienation, PC's lack of inclusion and narrow-minded curriculum plays an active part. As an institution, it is important to question how we can create a place moving forward for an interreligious inter community and how we can better celebrate diversity of ideas. To the left of me is Moore Hall. Formerly known as Antoninus Hall, this hall was home to the business, 
Economics, and Psychology Department. In 1988, the building underwent transformation as it became the home for the Department of Western Civilization, um, DWC program. This is a required program for all students of Providence College. This building was named after Cornelius C. Moore. He was a um, profoundly known attorney of Rhode Island from Newport, <laughs> a local himself. He also collected 18th century silver and has a collection currently in the archives of Providence College's library. Following yet another rebirth in 2017, the college made advancements um, in the celebration of diversity. I have chosen this location to pair with my research as it demonstrates the acknowledgement of multiculturalism in Moore Hall. This hall was transformed into the Center for Culture, Art, and Fellowship in 2017. In an effort to elevate the student voices of Latinos on the Providence College campus, I have chosen um, to focus my research on the written work of past and current students of Providence College. Through an in-depth research on the student newspaper, The Cowell, the student yearbook, Veritas, and anecdotes from Providence College magazine, I was able to depict a brief summary of the Latino experience and culture at Providence College. While storytelling was the primary focus of my research, I was able to substantiate the storytelling that I made with uh, qual quantitative data um, that was gathered by Providence College themselves. Uh, from my very first days on campus, I recall Moore Hall being the center of student life. From the first day I was on campus as a student of the Forest Foundation program, and later as a pre-orientation student for the First Generation Program Transitions, Moore Hall was a center that I called home. For Latinos like myself, Moore Hall serves as a reminder to celebrate your identity and embrace those around you. For alumni of color, Moore Hall is an ode to the power of student advocacy and an acknowledgement of their presence and importance on the Providence College campus. For many cur current friars, Moore Hall is home. In the background, this is Snyder Arena, named after Herman Damien Snyder. Since opening, there has been much to celebrate in regard to the history created monument in the halls of Snyder. This is home to the men's and women's ice hockey team. From the upset wins and NCAA appearances, one event personifies the voice and spirit of Friartown, the achievement of a lifetime dream as former athletic director Bob Driscoll stated. This achievement being the 2015 national championship won by the men's hockey team. Described as Destiny's team, the story of the 2015 national championship is deeper than most known. The impact that former Friar Drew Brown had cannot be mentioned enough. Recognized for its physical grit and relentless determination, the Friars men's hockey team modeled its persona after teammate Drew Brown. Drew Brown was an inspiration that pushed the men's hockey team to shock the hockey world when they defeated the hockey powerhouse of Boston University. After being hurt in the 2014 Hockey East semifinal, an MRI revealed a tumor that was a rare form of bone cancer, which caused him to miss the entire 2014-2015 season. Brown continued his long, courageous battle with the disease and became an inspiration for the Friars during their 2015 national championship run. He even laced up his skates the day before the first Frozen Four game. Drew Brown tragically passed away later at the age of 25 after his long battle against cancer. Drew Brown personified the spirit of Friartown and was someone we should all strive to be. Long before Providence College students traveled to the Amica Mutual Pavilion for basketball games, they traveled here to Hendrickson Field for football games. From 1921 to 1941, Providence College fielded a football team that competed with some of the best teams in the nation. So, however, when it started out, they were very underfunded. In the beginning, in 1920, 1921, they didn't know how they were going to get the football team together. But with its limited gymnasium and resources, they got it together. They played most of their home games here. However, in the future, they played a few at the uh, Cyclodrome down the street. Uh, it was a bicycle racetrack that was converted for gridiron football. Um, they were known as the Dominican team throughout. Everyone called them that because we're the Dominican Friars. And they rattled off a couple of big wins, like a road win against uh, Rutgers in 1930 in New Brunswick, New Jersey, the home of uh, or the birthplace of college football. Um, five professional football players came through Providence College, um, and the best was Hank Soar, who caught the 1938 um, NFL championship winning pass at the Polo Grounds in New York. And another familiar name that everyone should know or does know at Providence College is Mal Brown, and he also played on the football team. He ended up being a very uh, prominent trainer here as well. 
but uh, his record on the football team wasn't too good. And with a culmination of World War II, bad luck, and not a lot of wins, they ended up uh, cutting the football program. Also founded in 1921, one of the oldest sports programs at Providence College was the baseball program, which until 1999 had very successful seasons and over a 30-year span between 1967 and their final season in 1999, they only recorded nine losing seasons, producing a few Major League Baseball players. Several of those seasons, they went on to the College World Series Regional Finals, where they were only two wins away from going to the actual national championship in Omaha. And in their final season, 1999, lost to Florida State University, who were national runner-ups that year. In 1999, though, that was their last season because of a Title IX... uh, Sorry. (laughs) Title IX regulation, where they needed to match the amount of scholarship money that was going towards men's sports and women's sports. Instead of adding more opportunities for women, the school decided the only viable route they could take was to cut some of their successful sports programs. I compare cutting the baseball team in 1999 to the possibility of if we were to cut the basketball team after winning the Big East and going to the Sweet 16 a few years ago. Um, Overall, baseball has been mostly forgotten at Providence College since the discontinuation of the sport almost 25 years ago. But to quote, um, or to paraphrase an article from the Cal, Friars Baseball played every game as if it was their last because they knew that someday it was going to be. Now we end the tour in Slavin, which is the student center. Speaking of students, that is the main community the live Dalmatian mascots served for periods of time from 1935 to 2001. To fill the mascot-sized hole in their hearts, PC adopted a new mascot, the scariest one in the country, Friar Dom. To celebrate the school's 100th anniversary, PC added a new mascot to the squad, a two-legged Dalmatian named Huxley. A friend of mine, Elise from the class of 2022, was Huxley during her time here. She really saw how special Friar Town is when students, faculty, and the greater Providence community lit up with joy upon seeing her in costume. Now, the center of the center for students is Duncan. This is where Friartown gathers to fuel up with peers, our own friars, and professors alike. Friartown truly runs on Duncan. If there is one place on campus that is the home to the Friar community, it is Slavin Lawn and Slavin Center. As the home to many of the club offices, McPhail's, Alumni Dining Hall, and Duncan, it is where students, faculty, and staff all come together to form the Friar family. So there is no other place that is better to talk about how the community on campus pulled together through the COVID pandemic. On March 13th, 2020, the school announced that it would be shutting down and moving to online classes for the remainder of the spring semester. And during the pandemic, Providence College went through a lot of hard times with COVID restrictions, online classes, and just the feelings of emptiness and loneliness as described by the 2020 edition of the Veritas yearbook. But the, but the community pulled together throughout the pandemic, with one example being Dr. Tom King's organizational theory class hosting a YouTube video on March 22nd, 2020, called Dear College Students, encouraging young adults and college students throughout the nation to take the COVID guidelines seriously, garnering nearly 50,000 views. Other examples are the Cowles 2020 fall editions, where many articles encourage students to heed the warning seriously. And, um, and the Great Friar Comeback campaign held by the school with the slogan, let's call it a comeback, which helped encourage students to come together and work through the pandemic. By the spring semester of 2022, the school had returned back to normal by lifting the last COVID restrictions. And this school spirit was so strong that it helped propel the men's basketball team to their first ever Big East regular season championship and an appearance in the NCAA's March Madness Sweet 16th. 